So the subject of the talk is really St. Germain, who he is and how to contact him and what it is he really has to teach because he's really the one bringing in the new age, you know, what's called the new age. And that term has gotten kind of trampled on because it's come to me now everything, crystals and Sufi dancing and yoga and wh whatever people want to do, which are all fine, but um, the original message has gotten sort of watered down a little bit. So I guess some people might ask, well, who are you to talk about St. Germain? You know, I can read about him in a book, or somebody channeled a message to me from him. And so I'll just give you a little background, um, how I met St. Germain. And um, I talk about this in this book. Um, but what happened was I had spent time in India with Ram Dass, I guess, most of you are familiar with Ram Dass, and um, um, I had been in uh, living in New York City on the Lower East Side, uh, a couple blocks from Allen Ginsberg. This was in the late 60s, I guess, early 70s. And um, one day I heard this interview on uh, National Public Radio with Ram Dass, and he talked about, he was this Harvard professor who uh, started experimenting with LSD, and he went to India to find someone that could explain to him what he was experiencing and how to attain these higher states of consciousness naturally. So um, it was just amazing to hear this very learned erudite man uh, talking about wandering around India and finding this little old man in a blanket who knew everything about him and uh, could tell him the dream that he had the night before, uh, knew everything about him, all his work and all that, and it was just kind of mind-boggling. And Ram Dass kind of had a meltdown where he, uh, it just short-circuited that Western rational mind, you know, and um, so when I, he I heard this interview, I had this really strong pull to go, not particularly to hang out there, but I thought maybe I, will find some teacher like that myself. So um, not too long after, I, I did go to India and I wandered around all over the place. Wherever I heard of some extraordinary being, I would go check them out. And that's kind of the stories that are in this uh, book, Search for the Guru. It's just that quest that a lot of people go on looking for a teacher. And so I spent time with Ram Dass and uh, his guru, Neem Karoli Baba, and I uh, met Ananda May Mai, who was actually, uh, that was really a life-altering experience. Uh, because when she looked at, I met her on the street, um, which is, I'd, I'd, met, I'd gone to her ashram first, and I was not impressed by her at all. In fact, she seemed kind of bored with the whole scene, you know, I mean, you think it would be fun to be a guru, but what if you have a hundred people every day <laughs> bowing at your feet, you know, um, it gets boring after a while, you know, so, so I made a prayer, I wish I could meet her one day out in the country without all these disciples around, and about a month later I was in this little town, Jagannath Puri, and I was buying some grain in a little <coughs> shop, and the woman in front of me turned around, and it was her, she was completely alone, wow. <laughs> so we walked along together for a while, and um, then a few days later, I was in a rickshaw coming back from the Jagannath temple. She was by the side of the road. And um, she did this, which is, it, they don't do it anymore very much, but she, she bowed which, and said, you know, which, it's from the God in me, I bow to the God in you. Now with most people, that's, those are just words, you know, or it's wishful thinking, or you're just being polite, you know. But when she did it, I knew she was seeing God. Um, and it hit me so powerfully, I almost fell out of the rickshaw. I stood up, and it just something hit me up my heart. And I, I was just speechless. I went home, and I climbed up on the roof of that. We had a flat roof. It was right down by the, by the beach. And I thought, I want to see what she saw. I want to see within myself, you know. And that was one of the greatest inspirations for meditation that, I, that I've had, you know, 
And that's one of the greatest gifts you can give to somebody else, is to just always try to see the God in them. Sometimes you can think of it as a ball of golden light, even if somebody is angry at you, just focus on the light in your heart and the light in their heart, and there's a beam of light from your heart going to them. And uh, that no matter what they do, or what they've done in the past, or what they say, they have this basic goodness, and that this Christ light is within them. And that's really the essence of St. Germain's teachings. So, St. Germain is not really giving anything new, but the way he's giving it is new, and that he's giving it in the West, because some of these teachings have gotten very complicated in the East, and you can only get them if you spend years doing preliminary activities. You know, 100,000 prostrations would be just the beginning. Um, so, uh, and he's giving these teachings in a very simple, direct, straightforward way. So anyway, I, I left India and uh, came back to the West, and I was staying in Berkeley uh, with Jai Gopal. Uh, he used the name Jai Uthal now, he's a musician. And um, just feeling like, I don't know what I'm doing here anymore because uh, I spent so many years searching and before that I had just done everything that is available in the West that's supposed to bring you pleasure and happiness, you know, just fast cars and, you know, wine, women, and song, that whole thing, <laughs> and found that it didn't bring happiness. And so that's why I'd gone to India. And in India I found, I, I learned certain secrets that, um, that did bring happiness. But then my visa expired eventually. I had to come back to the West. <laughs> and I said, what am I doing back here? And I had lived with a yogi in the Himalayas who was getting ready to leave his body. Like these great yogis know when their work is done and they just uh, say it's time, I'm going to leave my body and they go into meditation for 21 days and then they just leave their bodies. Yeah. So uh, I decided that's a good idea, I'm going to do that. You know? so, but I said it's a serious thing so I should really ask permission. So. Uh, I was staying in uh, Jayutal's place, and one morning, again, this ball of light came into the room, and I heard this voice that said, go to Muir Woods, which is just outside of San Francisco. It's a redwood forest, mm -hmm. and I will meet you there. And I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting, but part of my mind sort of, right. so, so that didn't really happen, you know. <laughs> so, I uh, it was early in the morning, maybe 7 o'clock, and... Um, uh, it was pouring rain, so I got to Muir Woods. I was the only car in the parking lot, and I walked down the trail, and then I went off the trail, which you're not really supposed to do, but nobody was there, and I was very careful where I walked. So I walked up the hill, and I found a hollow redwood tree, and uh, it was hollow from a fire or something like that. So I got inside the trunk of the tree to get out of the rain. Sorry, yeah. So I. Uh, sat there doing this Vipassana meditation, which you do with your eyes open, but you just feel the in-breath and the out-breath, like the rise and fall of your chest. And that slows down the mind, and you just keep your eyes slightly open. Um, and if your mind wanders, you bring it back to the breath. And at first it seems kind of uh, stupid, but if you follow if you follow it and you discipline yourself, it slows down the mind and you start to become aware of the divine mind. So I was doing that and then I had the thought, okay, I'm going to ask for permission to leave my body. And um, I had never had a prayer answered in my life. I mean, I tried it when I was much younger and I pretty much had decided prayer doesn't work, but I said, okay, I'll try it one more time, this is something serious. So I prayed to Jesus and Sai Baba and, you know, Krishna and Rama and Neem Karoli Baba and Ananda May Mai, everybody I could think of. And um, I didn't feel anything, and I, I did mention Saint Germain because I had been a guest of the Theosophical Society in India, and I had read Unveiled Mysteries by Godfrey Ray King, which is a story about how he met Saint Germain. And so I named all these beings, and 
Um, the next thing I know, I saw two feet in front of me. And I looked up and there was a young man standing there. Now, if, if he had walked toward me through the woods, I would have heard his footsteps. I would have heard uh, twigs breaking, branches, things like that, you know. So there was nobody there one minute, and the next minute there was this young guy standing there. And um, he was just wearing normal clothes, like jeans and tennis shoes, and um, actually a suede, it looked like a suede jacket. So, and the strange thing is, even though it was raining, he wasn't wet. <laughs> and, um, and he knew my name, and he said, Peter, uh, your prayer has been answered. Um, he said, I, I, am, I, have, I am the part of the Godhead that has been sent to answer your prayer. And um, he said, you can leave your body if you wish, um, but before I grant your wish, I would like to show you something. So he touched me between the eyebrows. The next thing I knew, I'm, st I'm standing outside my physical body. And there is my <coughs> physical body still sitting inside the tree, meditating. And I'm standing there next to him in a finer body, which looked just like the physical body. So he put his arm around me. And the next thing I know, we were leaving the earth, you know, going mm -hmm. upward. And, uh, Soon we arrived at this place where beings were balls of light, like this uh, picture of the I Am Presence. Beautiful globes of light. Globes of light, like about this big, emanating these beautiful colors. And there was just this feeling of incredible bliss. And he called these beings like the permanent self, the permanent selves. And I said, this is it, this is where I want to be, <laughs> because um, it, it was just this feeling of overwhelming peace, happiness, and joy, you know, and you didn't have to figure out how to pay the rent, or, you know, fix your car, or anything, you have to deal with relationship issues, or any of that stuff, you know. So, um, so while I was contemplating that this is going to be my new home, uh, home, um, I started to hear this crying coming from someplace, and the crying got louder and louder. And then I, it was very annoying, and I, I started to look around to see where it was coming from. And I looked down, beneath my feet I saw the earth. It was just this ball, blue ball, like, you know, about the size of a baseball or something. And I, I realized that's where this crying was coming from. And he said, um, this is what the masters hear all the time. This is the suffering of humanity. And I just said, it, it was not nothing I had to think about. My heart just went out and said, I have to go back and help people. And um, I didn't really... Oh, he, he didn't present it in a formal way, but this is in a sense the bodhisattva vow that you, that the Buddhists give, like you, you vow to attain enlightenment for the benefit of others and to, and to come back and stay in embodiment uh, to help people. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's basically what I did, but it, it wasn't a rational choice at all. And later I wondered, what did I just do? <laughs> <laughs> So the next thing I knew, well, he said, now we're going to be working closely together. It, you could have stayed here and you would not have seen me again for a long, long time. You know, and it, and in India they have these time cycles that are called kalpas that are something like 240 million years. You know, so you could stay in bliss for 240 million years, but then eventually everything is recreated all over again. So, um, but he said, because you made this decision, we will be working closely together. And um, then he took me back uh, into back to the earth, and I was returned to my physical body. And then I looked up, and again, here's this young man in front of me. Uh -huh. And um, he said, 
go to Mount Shasta, the first person that you meet will tell you what to do there. And um, then he said, now I will show you who I am. And right in he took a few steps backward, and right in front of me, he turned into this master wearing a long white robe. And he really didn't look like this. He has, these masters have different forms on different levels. There was actually a picture of him in the original Unveiled Mysteries, where he looks very etheric, and it looks like he has dark curly hair. Um, very, very etheric picture, and that's the being he turned into. He faded out and disappeared. He was like Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know? <laughs> so, the, you know, one minute there was somebody and he really didn't look like this. He has, these masters have different forms on different levels. There was actually a picture of him in the original Unveiled Mysteries where he looks very etheric and it looks like he has dark curly hair. Um, very, very etheric picture and that's the being he turned into. And then he just completely faded out and disappeared. He was like Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know. <laughs> so, the, you know, one minute there was somebody physical in front of me, then the next minute he turns into this being in a white robe, and then boom, he's gone. And um, I was so energized, it's like I had picked up a live wire or something like that. I just got in my old van and there was still nobody in the parking lot because of the rain and drove to Mount Shasta. And then <clears throat> I was in the uh, uh, breakfast place there uh, and a young guy came up to me and said, you should see this lady by the name of Pearl. And so I don't know who that is, but I was told to do whatever the first person tells me to do. So he said, you can use my phone. So I called her and she said, come right up. So uh, when she came to the door, she said, I've been expecting you. And I said, what do you mean you've been expecting me? <laughs> she said, so after I sat down, she said, the Master Saint Germain came to me this morning and told, told me he was sending someone to see me. And um, so that was kind of the beginning. And. Uh, over the years, I had many more experiences, both with her and with Saint Germain. But the um, she said Saint Germain has brought you here, and I would say that Saint Germain has probably brought all of you here too. He definitely, through the uh, through the invitation of Audrey, brought me here. But on a higher level. I felt uh, his prompting to come here, and so I, I feel that he's invited you all also, that he's trying to get your attention. So um, you can tune into him as I'm talking, but the way Pearl taught me to tune into him was just to affirm his presence within you. And um, she said, he's helping you. And I said, well, I don't hear anything. Would you channel a message? What, you know, channel to me what he's saying. And she said, he will not let me channel because that would weaken you. The whole essence of his teachings is you get it within yourself. In order to become a master, you have to develop the God principle within yourself rather than rely on somebody else. You know, she said, if every time you want to know what to do in your life, you come to me to get a message from Saint Germain, that's not going to make you a master. So, uh, or even tuning in directly to Saint Germain, still he wants you to get it yourself. If you get stuck, then he will help you, but frequently it's not with a channeled message. Most of the time I get guidance, I don't hear words, it's the feeling. So there, there are many ways to get guidance. You know, you can use tarot cards, you can look at a flock of birds, uh, cast runestones, 
pick things out of a hat or whatever, <laughs> but all these things are open to interpretation. And the highest form of guidance is to just spontaneously do the right thing. You just know it's right and you do it. Um, on my way here today, I went past the road I was supposed to take, and as I started driving, the energy just kind of started getting lower and lower. And I went, uh-oh, I think I passed the right, that road. I, I'll turn around and see how it feels. So I went back, even though I asked St. Germain, which is the right way, I didn't hear anything. So I tuned in to my heart, and I turned around, and as I took the other road, then everything felt good, you know? And it's kind of like the car speeded up. It's almost like the car was getting the guidance too, you know? But it's, it's through my own inner perception which relays through your whole nervous system. So it's what some people would call a gut feeling, but it's not really in your gut, it's really in your heart. It goes through your whole body. So, Pearl said, turn your attention within and say, I am the presence of Saint Germain. And I said, I can't do that, I'm not Saint Germain. And she said, you're not claiming to be him, but you you have to, it's a way to focus your attention, to put your attention on what you want. Mm -hmm. So... Does it also mean embodying him? Well, yeah, I mean in a sense, but it's like, see this gets on with what's called, what the Tibetans call Guru Yoga. Mm -hmm. So the way that works is there's some quality you want to invoke, like say Kuan Yin, you want more compassion, mm -hmm. so you get a beautiful statue of Kuan Yin. And you meditate on Kuan Yin, and then what's... You, you don't meditate on, on, this, on the image of Kuan Yin as an image, you meditate on that is actually Kuan Yin. Mm -hmm. That that's the living presence of Kuan Yin. And gradually you uh, imagine that that image turns into light and goes into you, goes into your heart. Then you say, I am Kuan Yin. And that's kind of what I'm doing in this picture with the sword, is I'm saying, I am Manjusri the God of Wisdom. So I have the sword and so on. And and so on. And so I'm visualizing I am the God of Wisdom cutting through illusion, cutting through the knot of illusion. So doing an actual practice in the physical body helps to bring it in. You could also say I am the presence of Archangel Michael, cutting through all illusion with the sword of the flame, that kind of thing. Um, or you could say, I am the healing presence of the Medicine Buddha, and you hold your hand up and transmit healing energy. So whatever helps you, so whatever helps you to invoke that principle, um, so when you say, I am the presence of Saint Germain, um, you can just imagine him in front of you. He dissolves into light, goes into your heart, and you feel that his heart and your heart are one. And you imagine that like, say, an amethyst, a beautiful amethyst that is illuminated from within, and uh, that there is no separation between you and him. Now the important thing is, when you finish the meditation to dissolve that. And what happens in a lot of New Age practices is people don't do that last part of dissolving it. So uh, people, let's say, meditate on Mother Mary, and they actually feel they become Mother Mary. And then they don't do the, the dissolution part of it, and they walk around feeling they're the reincarnation of, of, of Mother Mary. So like one, one summer, three women came up to me separately and said, by the way, I want to tell you, I'm, 
I'm uh, Mother Mary, you know, I'm the reincarnation of Mother mm -hmm. Mary. There's a couple people I know that um, think that they're Saint Germain re-embodied, you know. And um, there are times when the Master can actually come right through you. They used to call it being overshadowed by the Master. I like the term overlit better. <laughs> you know? um, where the Master can use you if, if you're clear, like if you don't have a lot of um, ego or pride or things like that, the Master can come right through you and transmit a blessing to another person or to a group or even to a location. But it's then important to let go of that and um, go back to being yourself, you know. Um, there's a, a play that the uh, I Am people give in Mount Shasta every year about the life of Jesus. And there's a scene when Jesus is in the tomb and uh, the uh, Archangel Michael comes to roll back the stone so Jesus can, the resurrected Jesus can come out. And he lowers his sword and he, you know, says, uh, roll forth the stone, something. He commands the stone to roll back. And uh, at the, he said something like, by the power of Archangel Michael, that I am, come forth, you know. And at that moment, Archangel Michael actually came through the actor. And he became so uh, empowered by that, he thought he was actually Archangel Michael. And a couple of days later, people got hold of him and said, look, would you go see this lady Pearl? She'll help you get back into your body. You know? So she explained to him what had happened, that you have to let go of that, go back to being who you are. You know, Ram Dass told me a story where uh, he said he had a brother, or has a brother, I don't know if he's still alive, who's in a mental institution. And uh, Ram Dass went to visit him and uh, this brother thinks that he's Jesus, you know, and um, so the brother said to him, I don't understand, you know, you tell people that you're Christ and they worship you, I tell people I'm Christ and they lock me up. <laughs> and uh, Ram Dass said, well, no, I tell people I am a Christ, you tell people that you're Jesus Christ. <laughs> And that's a big difference, you know. So, um, so it's important to let go of that afterward, but um, you can invoke whatever quality you want uh, by the power of your attention. And, you know, having these beautiful pictures around your house or in your wherever it is you meditate is, is very helpful. Like a picture, like if you want to invoke Saint Germain, to look at that picture and actually, you know, look into his eyes and feel him dissolve into light and feel your oneness with him. So, you know, maybe we could all do that since I've been talking about it. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite quite simple process. And um, the Tibetans don't really teach this until people are very far advanced. There's what they call the generation phase, where you generate the deity or the master in front of you. But they don't, that's, that's where they leave it. So in other words, you're worshiping the being outside yourself, which is kind of the Piscean age, you know, where you sit at the feet of a master or a guru or a deity and worship and offer incense or whatever it is, you know. Uh, what Saint Germain is, is teaching in this age is that we become it, you know, and you worship it within yourself and find it within yourself. So, yes, you want to... I, I have a question. Um, yeah. What if you want to go to the master inside of you and you don't want to be, input, you know, like fused with, it, with anything except your higher self? I mean, is that... Yeah. Because like, that's, that's yeah. what I feel like I want to do more than trying to become Saint Germain. Well, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm glad you asked. That's, that's actually his teaching. Yeah. He doesn't want disciples. Because you know? we're all, like, I just yeah. believe we're all potentially, we're on the road to mastership. Um, totally. You know? Yeah, and if you start just, you know, it's like everything about you, like, you know, how you, um, you know, I was working on, you know, my, how I stand, and just, um, you know, just feeling like, 
That's beautiful. Well, that's actually the essence of St. Germain's teaching. And any true spiritual teacher or guru does not want disciples, you know. Uh, in fact, Neem Karoli Baba refused to play that role with me. There were some people that needed that. There was like some some girls in the front row would massage his feet and he'd pat them on the head and give them fruit and all that stuff because that's what they needed, you know? And I thought, well, he's completely ignoring me. Well, it wasn't until, you know, the last few years I actually realized what a profound teaching he was giving me, you know? So, um, the real teachers, the real gurus, well, you know, may sometimes ignore you. Yeah, if, you know, sometimes they'll pay attention to you, then other times completely ignore you, but they haven't forgotten about you. And so that's why St. Germain doesn't usually uh, give me verbal instructions or these other masters, some of whom I've also met in physical form. They manifested so I would know that they're real. I mean, I was born very skeptical person, a sci scientific background, studying aerospace engineering, and I didn't believe anything unless I could test it myself. So um, they had to really prove that they were real, and they wanted me to write about that. Uh, but the essence of what they're teaching is that it's all within you, and the way you become a master is by focusing on that light. So, just the, the subject of this workshop is St. Germain and his teachings, not just to, you know, get devotees for St. Germain, you know. He doesn't need that, he doesn't even, he doesn't want that. And, you know, this is not an organization, I'm not recruiting people for, you know, joining an organization or something. So, it's just... Um, his unique message as it's one of the people really bringing in the, the new age. Um, Question. Yeah. Um, he, never, he never had a body, right? Well, this is, this is, uh, this was going to be the other part of the oh, talk. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but, um, no, it's, I'm glad you mentioned that because, um, um, We'll get more into the meditating on the I am presence at the end, which is where it's all going, you know. So, but uh, since the subject of the workshop is Saint Germain, and um, he can be a great friend, it's just like saying, I don't need any friends because I have God. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, you have God, but it's still appropriate to have friends and to interact in the world with other people. So St. Germain is one of the beings you can interact with, kind of like an older brother. But also, um, all yeah. the other people are also God, too, which you can get to a level yeah, where you see exactly. Them also. exactly. So St. Germain's previous lifetime was as Sir Francis Bacon. The next thing we hear is there's this being in the early 1700s who's appearing in the courts of Europe. No one knew where he came from. But he always appeared to be about 40 years old, kind of appearing like this. This is supposedly how he appeared in the courts of Europe. So, um, that no one knew where he came from, but he was always exquisitely attired, had lots of jewels, and uh, no one ever saw him eat and uh, never, or drink wine, anything, didn't drink anything. Uh, seemed to know everybody and everything about about every situation. Uh, sometimes he was seen simultaneously in the court in Russia as well as the court in France because there were women who kept diaries and they say on this day Count Saint Germain appeared you know in Saint Petersburg in the royal court and then someone in France was saying on the same day he was there. Um, and there, there are a number of stories. There's one where a woman said, uh, met him in court and said, oh, I must have known your, um, your father because he looked very much like you. And he said, no, that was me. And she said, well, that's impossible because this man was about 40 years old and it's been, you know, 
30 years since I saw him, and he said, no, that was me. And then he told her the private things that they had talked about at that time. And um, she said, that is astounding. Uh, where were you born? And he said, um, Jerusalem. And um, then she said, well, how old are you? And he said, madam, I am far older <laughs> than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> so, see, there's some people that say he was born in Transylvania in the Rakazi family. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that he eventually came to France and so on. Now, Rudolf Steiner uh, shed some light on this. He said that over a period of about a hundred years, in the 18th century, there were about a dozen people with the name Saint Germain. And I've known two people in my life whose name last names were Saint Germain. I've uh, known that there's a guy in Mount Shasta that claims to be St. Germain and actually looks like him. Um, so it's easy to see how this confusion can arise. Plus there were people pretending to be St. Germain. One of them was a real kind of uh, sort of a clown who was kind of like I guess a playboy or something was dragging St. Germain's name in the mud, was just a real party guy and was claiming to be him, so that would account for the number of stories about St. Germain, that he was not a reputable person and so on. So um, there are many, many stories about St. Germain. There is also uh, in Germany, northern Germany, Count von Hessel, Karl von Hess, I guess is his name, and he said St. Germain had an alchemical laboratory in his castle, and then supposedly he had another uh, laboratory in the Chateau de Chambord in France. Well, Saint Germain was an ascended master at that time. He didn't need alchemical laboratories. Um, so, I think it's just there were a number of people that had that name. And uh, plus, Saint Germain used different names in different courts. So, he didn't always announce himself as Saint Germain, but he's He's very well known in the French court. Uh, what Saint Germain was doing at that time was trying to avert the French Revolution and to wake up the, the, the nobility to the abuses. You know that they were taxing people to death, and um, uh, that they should, the leaders should wake up, so uh, and and learn to work for the benefit of the common people. And I feel St. Germain is trying to do something similar now, that our society is on the verge of great changes, and he's trying to wake as many people up as possible. But there's a really uh, beautiful story uh, that um, St. Germain arranged uh, for one of these uh, noble ladies, Madame de Ademar, to introduce him to Marie Antoinette. And this woman took St. Germain to court, and uh, introduced him to Marie Antoinette, and um, he told, St. Germain told Marie Antoinette, I would like to meet with your husband, the king. And she said, okay, I will set it up. But St. Germain said, um, his chief minister, his name was Morepa, is a very uh, uh, poor advisor, and that he's giving the king bad advice. And um, I insist on meeting the king without that advisor present. So mm -hmm. Madame d'Ademar left with Saint Germain. And uh, what happened was the king went right to this minister, the Morepa, and said, Saint Germain wants to meet with me, but without you. Uh -huh. And this man said, well, I can't allow that. And he immediately issued a warrant for Saint Germain's arrest. And then he went right to the home, or the chateau, of uh, Madame Rademar and said, I'm very displeased with you for going around me trying to arrange a meeting with Saint Germain, that I'm going to have him arrested. And at that moment, the door burst open, and Saint Germain walked in. And he said to this minister, de Morepa, you are an evil man, not intentionally, but out of ignorance. And uh, because of you, the, nobil the, uh, the king and the queen will lose their heads and many of the nobility will suffer and there is going to be great 
bloodshed in France, and that is because of your uh, incompetence. And um, so he said, history will remember you as the man responsible for the downfall of a great nation. And at that moment he turned and left, slammed the door, and everyone rushed after him, and there was nobody there. He completely disappeared. So uh, this just gives you a little idea who Saint Germain was during that time, the late 1700s. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So, so he died as Francis Bacon in 1620 something. 1626. Yeah. Okay. And so his whole life in the 18th century that we know most about, mm -hmm. when yeah. he was called Saint Germain, he was um, ethereal then. He, he was, was an ascended, ascended being, which means. Oh, he, could, he could appear in a physical body, or many physical bodies, or different physical bodies, and then just completely dematerialize. Right. Oh, so he wasn't born in a no. physical body? No, as, as okay. 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 So that, that right. will, yeah. you know, shed a lot of light. That's why he didn't eat. He didn't That's drink. why he didn't eat. He could be multiple places simultaneously. Okay. He could precipitate gems, things like that. There's a story that he went to Napoleon, and he said to Napoleon, um, I will make you ruler of Europe. And he said, well, Napoleon said, well, I'm already, you know, practically ruler of Europe. And St. Germain said, well, but you're, you know, you will have a great downfall if you don't work with the Brothers of Light. And uh, so if you will agree to take orders from us, we will make you uh, ruler of Europe. And, and Napoleon said, how do I know you are who you say you are? And this took place in Versailles, and there was something like 17 doors in this room. St. Germain walked out, and he walked back in to all 17 doors simultaneously, and all the bodies merged back into one in front of Napoleon. Napoleon said, I still don't believe. <laughs> and then there was Waterloo. Then there was Waterloo, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so he was... This is not a guy that sat around meditating, learning to do tricks, you know what I mean? He was an ascended master, and so this being, can he can do all these things now. I have met him a number of times in physical form, once on an airplane, once at a Shakespeare play. I, I talk about this in my, my book, Adventures of a Western Mystic, but there may be times I've met him, or that some of you have met him without realizing that he can appear in feminine form as well as male form. Why don't we just take a few deep breaths, you know? So you're breathing in light, exhaling any darkness that might be inside you, and you're exhaling that darkness into a violet consuming flame, dissolving and consuming all negativity. Okay, now just, just gradually let your, stop the deep breathing and just observe your natural breath. The rise and fall of your chest, the way you naturally breathe. You can put the tip of your tongue against the roof of your mouth. This completes the bioelectric circuit. And if your mind goes to something like a fan or a pain in your knee or something, just put a label on it, thinking, and come back to your breath. And gradually you feel your mind slowing down. Any thought that comes up, you label thinking, and just feel the rise and fall of your chest. And as your mind slows down, you realize there's a space between the thoughts where your movie stops, your idea of who you think you are. And there you begin to contact infinite mind. Your mind is not within your head, 
It is not even just around your head. There is no limit to your mind. And you begin to feel this sense of peace. And you become aware that in the center of your chest there is a golden sun. And that light is the light that causes your heart to beat that causes you to breathe. That light is the source of your life in this body. And feel gratitude to that light for allowing you to go on living. You can say, thank you God. I am grateful for your light for your sustaining my life. You feel love for yourself. You can feel, I am a good person. I may have done bad things, but the light within me is good. can say, I am love, to yourself silently, and see this ball of golden light expand and feel a kind of pink light surrounding the gold sun, and feel I am love. I am the sun, S-U-N, of God. I am a master being of pure light. I am the living Christ. You can say if you like, I am the luminous presence of Jesus the Christ and imagine that you become a living Christ, an Ascended Master. You are a being of infinite love, wisdom, and power. And if you like, I will say an affirmation, and I will say it again. You can say it with me the second time. I am the commanding, governing presence of God. I am the commanding, governing presence of God. Going before me throughout this week. Going before me throughout this week. Bringing about the perfect divine plan in all activity. Bringing about the perfect divine plan in all activity. The light of God never fails. The light of God never fails. Now you can feel this gratitude to your own I Am Presence, whose heart is one with your heart. And all the Masters are available to you within your heart. So you can say, if you like, Thank you, St. Germain, for bringing me here. I would like to know more about you. I would like your help in my life and know how to be a part of the divine plan to work consciously with you as a master. Please train me in my mastery. So as you go forth, you can say, you know, I am the Master Presence going forth. I am the Presence of God driving this car. 
I am the resurrection and the life of my divine mission on earth. I am being shown what I am meant to do and I am doing it. You let those affirmations that we did go out and they mm -hmm. have affected your aura, they've affected the whole environment, they've affected Woodstock, they've affected the whole planet because Every being on earth is connected to that inner light. You know? So don't think that, oh, I just live in this out of the way place. How can I affect what's going on in Washington or Moscow or whatever it is? That's not true. You're connected with Vladimir Putin at this very moment. All you have to do is say his name and boom. Somehow his frequency picks that up. So he's God bless Vladimir Putin. You know, God bless Barack Obama. May there be peace and harmony between them. So there's just no limit to what you do.